No, I'd rather fly one of these than any of the other aircraft that I've flown. And I've flown all sorts of jets with lot, up to 10 engines, but I'd rather be in one of these in bad weather. And in very high winds, it's absolutely a wonderful aircraft. I've flown many times when the military helicopters and so on have been crowded because there's too much wind in displays. It, it works. The rotor blades are just like two sycamore seeds joined together at the, at the seed. Uh, they windmill around, but by being set at an angle and pushed along, they, the air still keeps flying up from underneath them, and it still keeps turning, but it stays up. I was interested in small aircraft, and very portable, but uh, also in World War II, another aircraft was made called the Hafner Rotor Shoot, and this was a twin-bladed autogyro, and uh, the idea was that a man could be towed behind a Whitley bomber or something, sitting in this little thing, and he could release when he wanted, and he could glide down and land where he, where he desired to. Whereas, of course, in those days, when you jumped out with a parachute, you went exactly where the wind decided to take you. So that was the inspiration, really, for a very small, practical aircraft. And so I sat down with a clean sheet of paper in 1960, and I designed this machine, which turned out actually to be far, far better than I would have dared to hope. Having made the first successful prototype, I, that had a very noisy engine in it and, and uh, not totally reliable. I went to different aircraft for different jobs. All variations on this basic design, the vital parts of the rotor head and rotor blades are the same. But one of the greatest assets of the autogyro is the, the vibration level is very low, much less than the average helicopter. It is naturally stable, and that means that a pilot can fly the aircraft but he can attend to other tasks while he's flying it. When I was in Saudi Arabia with this aircraft, I reloaded very complicated cameras about six times in a single flight. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that the rotors still keep turning, even if the engine stops. That doesn't mean that you can keep flying, but you, it, it doesn't fall out of the sky if the engine stops. Whereas with a helicopter, the pilot has to take a very quick action to, to become an autogyro. And so there are certain conditions of flight with a helicopter. If engine failure occurs or gearbox failure occurs, then you have a problem. I made this one, I completed it in 1967, just after I'd been flying for the James Bond film. And uh, this one has had silences on. It's been about the quietest aircraft in Europe, I think. It could not be detected at 3,000 feet above the Norfolk ambient noise level. It's a camera platform. It carries cameras uh, in various modes, uh, up to a pack of four cameras using special filters so that it can bring out colour differences that are too small to see normally. Or it can carry infrared equipment, which detects heat. Uh, it can detect uh, leaks in pipelines by the temperature change. Detection of animals or uh, missing cars, uh, transmitting to the ground while, it's, while the flying's going on, so a man can watch the picture and say, go over that bit again. It's been used for police work, and it was in 1970, it was, because it was so silent, it was used on the Loch Ness investigation looking for the monster. Of course, it makes no downdraft, so it doesn't disturb the ground at all. It doesn't frighten animals, that's another interesting thing. I've flown in Brazil in a storm that they say no aircraft can possibly survive. There were big pieces of palm tree passing me that had been blown off the mountain. And I just went out over the coast because it, I hoped the wind would be a little bit less violent up and down <laughs> over the coast. And in no time at all, it, it, it had clouded over, got absolutely black. The, it was, the sunlight had gone and a black thing came down from the sky and joined something coming up out of the water. And a, a water spout took place right beside the aircraft and uh, then gradually it eased away again the sun came out. I, I, a lot of people say, oh, it must take a lot of flying and you must be very busy flying the thing. I, this aircraft knows how to fly without me on board. It's completely naturally stable and it, it will ride out bumps. The only thing is that you trim it for a given speed and so on. If you open the throttle, it will roll a little bit one way due to the torque reaction from the propeller. But you can trim it for any condition and I would rather fly in rough wet weather than any other aircraft. I can make one probably in about five or six months. Uh, they don't all take the same time. In fact, uh, when I came back from making the James Bond film, I made the one there with the 100 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine. In. I started on it in January of 1967 and I finished it in May 1967. This pair of rotor blades I literally made in 10 days in the, the old link trainer room at Fighter Command headquarters. I was the weapons officer at Fighter Command at the time, 
and uh, I had a, access to a nice room in which to make the rose blades. <laughs> I made them in 10 days leave. They're very easy to fly in the same way that a motorcycle is quite easy to ride if you've ridden a bicycle. It's also a temptation to show off and do silly things because you can do such silly things and get away with it, but there is a limit.